Welcome back to the Placeholder Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. We got a great show for you today. We're going to talk a little race radio ban. The story that, well, as, as long as I've been a cycling journalist, just won't go away. We're going to talk a bit of Vuelta a España. And of course, wrapping up over the weekend, the Tour de France Femme of X Swift. Joining me today, Kit Nicholson. Welcome. Hello. Johnny Long. Hello. In the park. For the final time, hopefully. For the final time time final Oof, part that's pod. exciting memories and ronan mclaughlin ronan welcome i feel like i should say i'm back or something i can't remember the last time i was on Place it's Open been a show. while you got a backwards cap on as well ronan we've been keeping it three people but uh well the long promised slowly showing up changes to this podcast some some musical changes things like that that's what we were discussing right before so i had to pull ronan in to the meeting anyway let's get into our various topics of discussion. I want to kick off with the Tour de France Femme avec Zwift, which wrapped up over the weekend. It is officially the tightest Tour de France homme or femme there has ever been. Four seconds between Kasia Niudoma and Demi Vollering. Ronan, how did it go down? It was a, well, I don't really like the word epic. Sometimes but it was it's worth epic. using, though. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, it it's it worth it's using. Worth. Epic final epic. stage. Yeah, the final stage. I think that was. Undoubtedly, the best Grand Tour stage of all time. <laughs> to sit, to sit. Whoa, and watch it. Whoa. <laughs> going some might be recency well, bias there. Have you ever watched a stage where for fifty kilometers yeah, the overall point. win was like switching back and back and forth between Demi Vollering, who eventually went on to win the stage, having attacked and distanced Cassia Niudoma on the Col de Glandon, uh, did a fabulous descent, and then climbed up to Es with Paulina Royakers and managed to beat her in the sprint for the line, also beating Kasia Niodoma, who finished fourth in the stage, but not quite by enough to take the overall one. Kasia Niodoma holding on by four seconds to win the Tour de France, which is... I mean, it wasn't a final day time trial. That's maybe the only way it could have been approved. But no. apart from that, it was just about as good as it could get. <laughs> Shut your mouth, Ronan. <laughs> Question for the floor. When Outdoors was added to the final stage and with the Col de Glandon, which is a bleak, bastard of a climb what did it's you reckon really was going to happen it's yeah it's a that's a brute of a stage did anyone ever think that this could this sort of thing would happen it looked to me like it no. was a demi vollering showdown yeah. and it should take three minutes yeah that was my assumption was yeah the vollering showdown took three minutes i mean let, let's th- there was quite a few people out there who were like well you know there's not quite an asterisk next to this this victory but like there's a crash so not only did vollering lose time in the crash early in the race but she also hurt herself right like she posted a photo i think it was the day afterwards sitting next to the pool saying it was time to recover and you could just see a massive massive bruise on her butt like clearly a very bad bad crash that probably affected her you could also see her like very gingerly get up on the podium for example uh, at the end of the race i guess to sort of return to the I can't actually think of a better one, Ronan. I can't think of a better stage now that you actually say that. But to return to your your contention that this is the you know the, one of the greatest Grand Tour stages of all time, it's not what I would have expected based on the route. In fact, I wrote two things in the Escape Collective group chat. Uh, the first one really surprised me. That that but both turned out to be horribly horribly wrong. One of them was I kind of wish that this is one of those like 65k stages where they just sort of went flat for a while and then straight up helped to us, right? Because I think coming into it, I would have assumed that would be a better race because on the Glandon, which I, I feel like a lot of people are f- confusing this climb with the Grenoll, uh, which, is, which, which is where uh, Pogacar cracked and Vingigo won the 2023 Tour de France. The Glandon, which takes like an hour, I think it took... I think it took Demi like an hour and five minutes or something like that. It's a really long it's climb. It's always covered in fog. I swear. Always covered in fog. I did it it's in just fog. really, it was... it's really horrible and nasty. And Volering attacked on that and it looked like it was over, right? Like she took a minute on that and it looked like she was just going to ride across the valley over to Altuez, take another minute and the thing was going to be done. And the second thing that I sent to this group chat that ended up being extremely wrong was RIP Kasia. <laughs> Which was also clearly incorrect. But it, you're right. It was it was like 50 plus kilometers where we just didn't know what was going to happen. You also sent a photo comparing uh, the Glandon to climbs in Colorado. But it was a graphic that had already been made by someone. But who, 
How many people are there in Colorado where this is enough of a reference point for people to understand? <laughs> so that image came from an old friend of mine, Zach Lee, uh, who also makes these really cool kind of like subway style maps of riding areas. So like Boulder has one. I think there's from California. Oh, I've seen them, yeah. Mallorca. Yeah, they're super cool. Uh, anyway, he, he also does these, these graphics that sort of compare climb sizes. And if, if anyone's ever ridden in Boulder and you've ridden Super Flag, which is like the famous climb in Boulder, the Glendon is three, almost three super flags, like stacked on top of each other. It is absolutely, it's an absolute monster. It's one of my anyway. least favorite climbs I've ever done. And not, you know, it, it's, I've done a few climbs in the Alps, but I think what makes the Glendon really hard is that you're, kind, you're almost in, you, you, there are high sided mountains, higher sided mountains on either side of you, which is probably why there's always so much fog. So there's nothing to, not, not that the racers are looking at anything, but there's nothing to, there's nothing to break it up. It just goes up and up and up and up and up and it's and it gets steeper, like some of the Alps do, towards the top, which is just mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's ten more gaps for anybody for Irish references. If we're gonna keep it local. Here. About a thousand Arthur seats probably. I don't know. Johnny? I was just trying to Snape's yeah, in was, London. Oh God, Box Hill. It has to be but, Box but, Hill. But, yeah, I didn't go, I didn't go yeah. uphill. I didn't go uphill. Fifty two box hills. <laughs> On the crash thing, I mean, yeah, the, it's it's like oh, it would have been nice for volleying if she hadn't crashed, but it's cycling. I mean, if you look at the staying upright of times is that, part of the sport. Yeah, and and yeah. the number of times that you see races where riders crash out, and it's like, oh, and and but we never really we never say oh, but if oh, I suppose we do sometimes. If X hadn't crashed out, then blah blah blah, it would have been ended differently. Obviously, it would. What ifs are everywhere, but it is part of cycling, and part of the reason and part of the story on the day that volleying did crash was that Kasia was better positioned. And that's part of racing too. Casio is better positioned and SD works. Ooh, good point. Didn't exactly SD works together to try and save volleying. I mean, had, had she had one or two riders more there and a couple of turns each, it could have been an entirely yeah. different finish. Four to, seconds, to remember. Yeah, that, Lorena that, yeah. Weaver's had to pull for 100 meters and she would have made a difference. I think the, the, sort of, the way we look at this though is slightly different this time because volleying had a nasty crash and stayed in the race. Whereas quite often when a, if when a favorite has a nasty crash and exits the race, the comparison isn't there. I think that's a key, you know, it probably makes it harder for volleying also. It's like, she was still so close. Uh, and her post-stage interview was like, yeah, it was difficult to watch also. Uh, I'm sure it was more difficult for her to do, but um, yeah, I think, I think just remaining in the race, as much as you don't want to see anybody seriously injured, it's almost like staying in the race was the, the harder way to finish it here. Mm. And a word for Royak is, I mean, looking at that final podium, at the end of the day, I probably owe somebody money for saying that, but um, by the end of the race, you've got three riders on the GC podium and they're all within 10 seconds. So Royak is, and Vollering, and probably went back to their team buses and went, where could I find the, those seconds? And Roy Royak is, you know, Fenix Takunik were not favourites to take this Tour de France and they came bloody close. Um, also, we should say, Puck Peters at her first ever stage race. Yeah, she felt at 11th overall um, on the Alpe d'Huez stage, but... She was second going into it. And obviously, you know, that if those are hard climbs for the rest of the peloton, those are the hardest climbs she has ever raced up. And she'd already done that. She'd already been able to say that sentence probably several times that week. But yeah, Roy Royak is, and she probably, she looked at times better than Vollering on that climb. So, yeah. um, you know, there must've been a lot of people She looked going, super comfortable. Hmm. She yeah, looked she like, did. like yeah, she was smooth. Particularly, so the very bottom of Alta is the hardest part. And she was just out of the saddle, like sort of just, you know, tap dancing on the pedals as as we like to say sitting behind volering like the whole sort of first what, kilometer and a half two kilometers which again is like the it's incredibly steep down at the bottom there uh, i mentioned earlier that volering did an incredible descent off the glandon and roy Ackers also did but not quite as good and definitely there was a few times she had to close those gaps and i wonder on the alp if she hadn't made those efforts to close back to volering each time she was distanced on the descent if that could have been the difference, if that you know, if she's looking at that and thinking that's where I could have won the Tour de France, whereas Vollering is looking at a crash and going that's where I lost the Tour de France. Uh, meanwhile, Kasia is the only one that actually won the Tour de France. Or even just, or even really just thinking, I could have attacked, I could have sprinted into the final kilometer earlier. Um, you, you know, the four seconds think, is such a small. I think Vollering finished so strong. She's maybe looking at that also and going, had I a kilometer of effort on me at the end or did I have an extra 500 meters of effort? Because that's, you know, that, that she finished so strong and was, you know, you see riders finish on that stage and sort of collapse over the line. Whereas Vollering sort of celebrated over the line. I, 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 where 
I'm reading into something here I shouldn't, but I, I watched the, the replays after we realized it was like a four second gap and thought to myself, hmm, what, was there four seconds to be had there? I think that might have been... Uh, not, not in the finishing straight, but in like attacking earlier for the, the finish, if that makes sense. My one thing is SD Works is a, an HR management sort of software company. And do you think the bigwigs are watching it being like, is this showing our brand in the best light this week? <laughs> well, there was one fantastic moment, which didn't involve a, a teammate on a bike, but at the top of the Glandon, um, there was a beautifully choreographed um, jacket hand up. It was lovely. And it just made me think back to, sorry, Jai, but Jai Hindley at the Giro in 20, whatever it was, 2020, when um, he almost fell off his bike trying to put mm. a jacket on. <laughs> um, it was very well done. There was and another Giro planned. one before that for D, who was, it wasn't well, Wilco Kelderman. when Kelderman. he was with DSM, it was Jai Hindley. I think it's with... It was Jai Hindley and... Uh, and Wilco, was Kel- 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 Kelderman. Yeah, Kelderman, yeah. Kelderman, yeah. Together. Um, I've never seen uh, that, that method being used to put a jacket on before, have you guys? Makes a lot of sense, but no. It only, well, I think it only works if you, it was one of those short sleeve mm. jackets. Uh, and I think that's the only because you have to be able to get your arm like all the way through it, and it, a long sleeve you would just stick your arm and it would get stuck, and then you, <laughs> you know, would have nothing to hold onto the handlebars with. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've never seen it done with a jacket, but I did. I went to European Championships with Ireland one time uh, on the twenty three team, and I can't remember if it was like all on the twenty three riders or junior riders, but the national team coach had decided that it must have been on the twenty threes because he was practicing giving out musettes, and you probably wouldn't get a musette in a junior race. Uh, and some of the writers had never had musettes, so the the coach decided that the best way for them to take the musette would be the same sort of approach that Demi Vollering had on on Sunday. I've so seen instead that of like been done before, yeah. The well, of- instead of grabbing the string like everybody ever has done to get a musette, this coach decided that the best idea would be to have these kids put their arms through the musette, and so they practice it in training. And, and all three writers who practice it got ripped straight off their bikes and thrown straight onto the ground. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it worked that time, but I, I don't know if I would rely on it too often. I've definitely seen that done in the professional peloton. Definitely. Where they put their whole hand straight where, through. Where they're, where they're getting, yeah, where, where it's practical, you know, when they're going slowly in a grand tour, uh, probably hmm. the Vuelta, um, when they're going through, a, uh, you know, so it's, when it's a bag laden with food and it just gets uh. kind of slotted over the heads. Uh. I've definitely well, I mean, seen like a whole and, body though, not just an arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just always oh, think well, the, this was just the arm, no, but I also think it was just the, the coach just didn't let go of the bag was part ah, of the problem. <laughs> Do we think the straps on musettes are too long? I always when when you see them being handed out, you if they're just a bit shorter, it would be yeah. But then they, they a lot of teams tie. They em. just take the stuff out and then they chuck it anyway these days, don't they? I don't know. It just seems seems asking for trouble. Then if they're a tiny if bit shorter, if it was too short, though, Johnny, you couldn't like have it over your head on your back and like able to swing it around your back until you get a point where you can like bring it around and then empty the contents out. If it was too short, uh, it would be like high up. I like, think- Like Katie said, the, they do sometimes put a knot in it to shorten it. Yeah. And, and it also, also gives you something to grab hold of. I think they I should think use stretchy thing, material. And then Part it, of the thing, Johnny, is that you often see this with riders who are getting, or having difficulty with the musette. Uh, when you see it done well and done right, it the works. length of them makes a lot of sense, yeah. But when- Someone's We're never shown that on TV. Like, We're only ever shown the bad ones. <laughs> yeah, when somebody's <laughs> crashed in the feed zone or Remco Evans was attacking. Mm. Can, can I shout out Puck Peterson real quick? I know, I know you already did, Kit, but I would just like to point out that this is a rider who has spent the entire summer preparing for the Olympic Games in the mountain bike, a event that took her an hour and 27 minutes, and then turned around and won the white jersey and was on the podium until the final day at the Tour de France. The final stage, the Glandon alone took an hour and seven minutes for her. So 20 minutes shorter than her entire <laughs> Olympic mountain bike race, the race that she's been training for all summer. And then she had to do an out and up to Wes after it. I would just like it. It, it the is specificity mad. like the, the specificity normally required at this level is such that like that shouldn't really be possible. Right. Like we've seen we've seen on the men's side, we saw like Tom Pidcock kind of try and f- fail to do both multiple times. Right. If he's focused on one or focused on the other, he can do it. But it's really hard to do both. And I just thought it was it was an incredible ride from her this week, and and yeah, just intriguing to see what she does going forward. I think wasn't it her first stage race? It was her first, first ever stage, stage race. race. Yeah. Yep, and uh, the first, first classified stage. climbs as well. First stage <laughs> at a, race at a bike France. race, and her first. <laughs> yeah. so she, also got, she got her first pro road win um, on stage four in Liège. 
Yeah, it's mad. She, I mean, I think she she did an altitude training camp before the Olympics, but she hasn't. I saw or heard somewhere that she had looked at the sort of and thought, I can get the white jersey. And so she did come out of the Olympics and just keep training. Didn't go back to altitude, but she, yeah, it's it's bonkers. I want to switch to the Vuelta. Uh oh. We're going to say, is that on say right all now? nice things? It is on right now. Huh, interesting. We're going to say all nice things so that Dane doesn't pop out of the woodwork. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but nice things about the Vuelta. Currently, it's, it's three AM for him. So surely he's not popping on. <laughs> that's just that's true. why we recorded now, isn't it, guys? <laughs> yeah. Is that <laughs> Vuelta Burgos you're talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Vuelta Poland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so currently, currently leading the Vuelta Espana. I mean, so it's been it started with the with the very flat, very 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 flat, and quite straight. Time trial, um, which was won by Brandon McDonalty. Was that That's exciting? Say about that. uh, well, yeah, it was fine. Um, uh, but what happened? I came <laughs> third. But yeah, I mean, let's give a give a note to Matthias Vacek, who looked like he was going to win the thing. Um, he was that was very good. Czech national champion. Well done. Um, but what happened? I was third that day. The second stage was the first road stage. It was the slowest. It was very slow. It was it was quite dull. Um, two Spanish riders in the breakaway. What happened? I came second to Caden Groves, and then he had he just basically had to come first it was written in the stars um he was already in the red jersey and he went and did it and it was his first win since that horrible crash at in flanders um in march and it's, for, and it's only the second win of the year um so it was good to see the uh are they are they red bull inspired is it a red yes. bull inspired celebration yeah. yes he I've, says they're not but they are i've got the yeah. information we, here because we oh, saw okay. it in belgium we got a photo of Ronan, a video of Ronan flapping his arms going across the yellow jersey Red Bull stand at a petrol station. Yeah. I think it might be when he's wearing a leader's jersey at a Grand Tour, there might be a specific um, but Red bonus. jersey gives you wings. There's like a bonus in his thing because then in, in petrol stations across Spain, they can now put Wout van Aert red jersey with stacks of Red Bull. I don't, you know what? I don't blame him. To have the presence of mind to win a, a Grand Tour sprint stage and then be like, oh yes, the flappy, the flappy wing thing. Yeah. <laughs> to then get like, you know, have many thousands of pounds. Can, I, can I just enter, interject for one second just to say that Red Bull does not give you wings. That's been proven. It, it just gives you case, wings. Yes. Wings. I, I, don't want, I don't want us landing in the middle of a lawsuit where someone has gone out and got a Red Bull and not got wings. Brandon McNulty won the opening time trial. The Phoenix of Phoenix. Is he from Phoenix? I, th- I just I just googled him. I think he's from Phoenix. <laughs> I would never have guessed he was from Phoenix ever. He may. I mean, it says born in Phoenix. That doesn't yeah, that, necessarily that, mean he grew up there. Uh, but I should Phoenix know where he's Phoenix. from. It was don't. he was the only the Phoenix two, of Phoenix. he was one of only two riders to go over fifty seven kilometers per hour. Um, and Ramon right wasn't one of them. I saw it was a good, um, it was a good good t- time trial. It was very windy. It didn't look very nice. I saw some stats online that. Any time Brandon McNulty has led a stage race, UAE Team Emirates haven't won it. Ooh. Uh-oh. What was the crazy stat about, about ridiculously small number of riders that have worn a leader's jersey at a Grand Tour this year? Yes, well, it's, like the, it's just that, is that there's a ridiculously small number of riders who've worn a leader's jersey at a Grand Tour this year. Sh- and Wout sh- Van Tadej Pogacar, and Tadej Pogacar are the only ones who've worn it more than one day. Yeah. So Navarez and Bardet have won the each. Yes. Navarez at the Giro, Bardet at the Tour. Pogaccia had all the yes. other Grand Tour leaders jersey days until, which was like 39 until and Brandon McDulty got one. So he's on one. And, and Van Aert has two. And Richard Carapaz. Yes, Carapaz. But yeah, that is slim I, picking. How can I forget Carapaz is one of my own draft picks. Speaking yeah. of leaders jerseys, special classification jerseys, this is a, a fun fact, but partly because there's been very little else to talk about to the Vuelta. But Luis Angel Shh. Mate, yeah, well, you know, Dane. we've established it's very early. He might be rolling over, but he, um, anyway. Um, so Lu- Luis Angel Mate, who has been in the breakaway, who was in the breakaway two days in a row, after, clearly after the KOM jersey. Um, but Stefan Kung snatched it from him on the second day. He's taken it for the going into the fourth stage, where there is a bloody great mountain at the end. So it's his last chance to wear a leader's jersey at his final Grand Tour ever before he retires. The last time he wore the KOM jersey at the Vuelta was in 2018 when he wore it for 15 days before Thomas de Gent stole nah. it off him and took it, took it all the way to the end. Rude. So that's quite a fun fact. I, I a, was, that's a good fact. I was going to say, I, I was surprised to hear Luis Angel Mate was still going because in my head, he's older than time at this point. Yeah, he's at Iscatel. So I'm glad he's getting a rest. And the other uh, thing from this Vuelta is that when Van Aert got the red jersey, 
Viz Melisa Bike immediately put the red jersey on sale on their online shop for as long as he was in the jersey for. Which is I've two not, days. But I've not days. seen teams selling Grand Tour leaders jerseys unless they like win it. So Viz Melisa Bike okay. and their merch, maybe that's their new like strategy is to just sell an ungodly amount of merch they to the Benelux sell a region. Lot of merch. Every single one of their posts has got a, a link to their shop. Oh, is it the jersey or is it just the t shirt? No, it's a jersey. A jersey? Okay. It's a 125 euro jersey. Jeez. Imagine seeing one of them in the wild. It would be, I would, I'd walk into a lamppost or something. I'd be so distracted. <laughs> They're selling them to the, wild Van Art, to the Van Art family. We have the return of a story that I feel like I've been covering this story literally since I started doing this job. So 14, 15 years now. It extends back even before then. It extends back into Hein Verbrugge, who was the UCI president from like, what, 91 to 05, I think. And then when I first first started doing this, it was Pat McQuaid. And the story is the race radio story. And it's the, the question of whether race radios belong in professional cycling, whether they make racing boring, whether they're crucial for safety, all these sort of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this has sort of raised its head again. One, or sort of, I guess, first, at least in, in from my perspective, because the Olympic road races were so good and they didn't have radios. And so people were sort of started chattering about that again. And then at the Tour of Poland, the Vuelta of Poland, they did another test, like a, a no radio test. Ronan, you've, you've raced with radios without ra- radios. Why does this keep coming up? Uh, uh, let, let me first tell you what it is. And that's uh, specifically the UCA are trialing at the Tour of Poland and Vuelta Burgos, which have both happened now already. But uh, they're trialing a, a test where only two riders per team are allowed to wear a radio. Uh, according to the UCA, this is a bid to remove both a source of distraction for riders and a physical hazard because the radio units are mounted on their backs. Uh, according to the UCA, the trial will limit the information riders receive from their director sportifs, uh, encouraging them to make their own tactical decisions while also staying alert to safety hazards. Is that why they had captain armbands on? Was that to de- uh, denote who was in a radio? Because I saw be. the pictures from Vuelta Burgos and I was like, why? Who, what is happening? Because they had the yellow captain armbands on. We should know the answer to this question. We, we will find out for next that week's episode. That is not something that came up when I was researching this piece. But well, I couldn't. Mean when I did a quick search, I couldn't really yeah. find out. But hmm. yeah, it would, would make it sense. Would be, it would be useful to go back and look at the photos and see if the same writers wearing the armbands are, are wearing the videos. And perhaps we'll, we'll do that. But um, the UCI said the decision is based on discussions on the subject with Safer which led to the conclusion that earpieces could be both a source of distraction and a physical hazard. I'm, I'm reading that part Sa- again. Safer, Safer is an organization built within to the make UCI. Bike it's like racing. a it's yeah. like a committee that it's uh, tasked with improving the safety of, of bike racing. I, I haven't read that reasoning. I kind of really have to wonder if the people making these decisions have ever even seen a bike race, never mind participated <laughs> in a bike race. Uh, <laughs> well, let, let's 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 hold hold our opinions for just a, a brief moment. I do want to get to like whether what we think should happen here, but I do want like a brief just brief history lesson. I'll, I'll keep it I'll keep it short. So again, this is something that sort of popped up over and over and over again. It was a Heinverbergen thing back like in the Armstrong era, even. Radios were just starting to come into prominence at that point. And there was a lot of questions as to whether it was sort of like in the spirit of the sport. And then the UCI actually made quite a significant push to remove them in sort of 2010, 2011, 2012. And it came to a head in 2011. I remember this this vividly. It was one of my first years covering the sport. And it was basically ended up being a showdown between teams and specifically the AIGCP, which is the team sort of organization, which is at that point run or, or the president of which was John the Vodders and Pat McQuaid and the UCI who were trying, they basically announced that they were going to remove race radios from the, the upper tiers of competition. So world tour pro tour in 2012. And in response, the teams actually came back and for like one of the only times I've ever seen in pro cycling, they actually all banded together and effectively like stood in a wall together, linked arms and said, we're not going to the Tour of Beijing, which was the UCI's sort of like strange cash cow at that point. And the UCI actually folded. The UCI said, all right, well, if you won't go to the Tour of Beijing, I guess we'll have to keep radios. And the, and the, the whole sort of topic, I guess, sort of didn't disappear, but it kind of faded again until about 2016 when 
the UCI determined that that actually more than just the World Tour, because for a while it was only the World Tour could use radios, that like all pro divisions could use radios. And it's kind of been like that since then. So it's been like nearing 10 years with very little discussion of this particular topic, other than sort of the occasional side chat about whether people think that they should exist or not. And then all of a sudden, back in the news. So there's your like very brief radio history lesson. Now, like, what do we think? Like, I, I don't want to harp on this too much, again, because it's, it's not like it's the first time this has been discussed. This is going on 20 years now. What's, what's the official uh, escape collective position on, on race radios? Well, the, the official Ronald McLaughlin position will surprise no one in that I think this is a, a bad idea. Uh, I think it just, You mean removing uh, them is a bad idea? Yes, uh, I think it just reminds us that the the UCI is run by a group of clueless dinosaurs. If I'm if I'm truly honest, um, because adding or removing race radios will not. I know we all looked at the Olympics and thought, oh, that racing was amazing, but that racing wasn't amazing because there was no radios. It could well have been amazing with radios. I, I, I the main the main thing for me is that I just see it as another highlight in how the UCI and cycling in general can actually look at something see evidence and then make the wrong interventions based based off of it it's like you know the race radios i i would argue that in terms of safety we need those uh in bike racing uh, for no other reason other than than safety there are examples where riders in under 23 races have have crashed off the roadside and their teams have only realized when they got to the finish line that somebody was still out on the course with without a bike or something because the rider didn't have a way to communicate with the team in 2024 i remind you when we can like communicate with each other in countless various different ways and the uci's sort of rationale is that we want to ban radios to make racing more exciting instead of taking a step back and going you know what actually we kind of need these for safety what could we do instead well here's what we could do we could broadcast every single communication that goes through those radios and it would be the TV right, a TV broadcaster's decision which ones actually go to air. But instead of the farce that we had at the Tour de France where the teams had like final say over what was broadcast and the race radio that ended up on TV was just literally the worst version that could have possibly came out. It was just countless repeats of get to the front, don't forget <laughs> to eat and drink. We are now about to approach the climb. It was, it was terrible. My God, you couldn't have made it worse had you tried. Instead of just saying, right, you want to participate in this year's Tour de France, you have to give us your race radio and we can broadcast whatever we want. Uh, and then on top of that, the UCI's all their reasoning that the radios on the rider's back presents a safety issue because they're like clunky things that the rider could fall on. I mean, that's the very same organization that banned riders from wrapping radios in foam and having them on their chest because it may present an aerodynamic gain that everybody could access for free in a time trial. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, there's just no rhyme or reason to it. I, the, the main point for me is I think it's a huge missed opportunity in terms of making cycling more accessible and more interesting to watch. Uh, and they've gone the other direction and just banning all communication. My question is how we're, it's because we're never made privy to it, but how many huge tactical changes actually made in race? Like when they're saying it's going to make it more exciting, is that just through chaos? But then like how much, how, because we never see it. So how much is actually being, said to the riders like how much because sometimes the the ds's and the feeds they're watching is like a minute behind there could well be scenarios where riders are discussing like plans for the rest of the stage over a radio but what you'll even find at the moment is that even with race radios for those like messages they want to ensure that nobody else hears they will send a rider back to the car and so you know that, that's that kind of yeah that that sort of tells you that Maybe race radios and broadcasting that that those communications might not be that interesting, but I think that comes back to me again for the, the safety aspect of it. You, like we need to have race radios. We'll do the best we can. To specifically answer your question, Johnny, like tactics will change mid stage. Teams will communicate those over race radio, but again, I think just broadcasting that it either forces the teams to come up with cryptic ways of communicating their plans, Plan B, Plan C, Plan D, or whatever, or we just get more interesting stuff to listen to. I mean, what what is generally happening over the radios is the directors are just updating the riders on like what the race scenario is. So it's less about like, oh, you should attack when you go around the next right hand corner. Like that, like that sort of thing isn't happening. It's just like this is the time gap. This is how many riders are here. These are the two guys to pay attention to. Like that, that that that's the sort of thing that's going down. Going but also, down. quite it's, often, it's not, 
send a team a staffer up the road if it's if there's risk of wind and to be able to say you know or if there are obst- potential obstacles coming up they'll go and assess the road surface or which side i mean even i've i've seen people talking about different road surfaces and which side of the road to take over um oh my it's, god yeah it's, it's, so you often send up a you know one of the extra team cars will go up the road and just check to make sure that you know all the tiny little details are, are dealt with hmm. and, and you could argue it both ways you could you could argue that having that information creates chaos in the bunch as everybody is like trying to get back to the front and their DSs are saying to them over the radio, get to the front, get to the front, get to the front. Or you could argue that not having radios just leads to more chaos as riders are having to go back and forth to the team car, riders are having to try and like Chinese whispers within the peloton of there's a corner coming up that's really bad and it goes to the left and then the next rider hears about it and it goes to the right and then the next rider come, hears about it and then it's all of a sudden it's a speed bump with a t-rex jumping out of it it's like <laughs> <laughs> there is data okay there is a study there is a study done i had to go i had to go dig this out because i remembered it from ages ago uh there's a study done by a professor at the toulouse business school who analyzed this is very old now but analyzed 245 stages of the tour de france from 1991 <laughs> to 1996 <laughs> when there were no radios that was pre-radio and then 120 more stages from 2001 to 2005 when there were radios. So that was uh, over 40,000 results that were looked at. And the result was basically there was no significant increase in the number of bunch sprints. So part, part of the sort of like uh, argument, I guess, is that the Peloton can't time its catch as well, right? So breakaways survive more often, which is in theory more exciting. But there was no meaningful increase in bunch sprints or in, on the other side of that, no meaningful increase in, in breakaways surviving. And the delay, like the gap in between successful breakaways and the Peloton actually increased with the radios. So basically the theory there was that with radios, the only thing that changed was the Peloton was aware of a sort of doomed st- chase earlier and so would just sort of like take the foot off the gas and just be like oh, we'll save it for tomorrow so that was that was basically the only two things that came out of the data sounds also like and, there are a load of other factors that may not have been well yeah, they probably so did if, get in, if you, induced but you know if you sum that up it basically it, it it confirms what ronan was saying which is that it doesn't have a particularly large impact on ronan tactics yeah the thing that you need if you want to have exciting racing is a global pandemic not a race radio band <laughs> What you mean? Or, because riders are dropping off because they got COVID. No, no, because I just I'm, I'm another thing we've heard over the last four years right. is that when riders came back from the COVID break, they were just they were racing because they never knew which day was going to be the last day of the race. Uh, yeah, and that was. Uh, <laughs> but you know, fast forward four years, yeah, yeah, that hasn't really that. slowed down. You know, I, I think there's another explanation there. But yeah, like Kaylee, how many times have you and I discussed and wrote over the last couple of years about why breakaways are now surviving? And yeah. that the, the race radios isn't the reason they're surviving, but it's also not the reason that they're getting caught. It's like that's why it's yeah. just a silly. It's just a silly. I don't know why the UCI keeps doing this. Like, like I said, I, I, I was just reading these headlines of, around you know Richard Pluga and and David Lepartien. Lepartien calling calling some fake news, or was it Pluga calling a fake? News? I can't remember. No, Somebody was, was calling, calling a fake, fake news. news. Yeah. Anyway, it's just dumb. <laughs> it's just like it's just it just doesn't do much. If you want more exciting racing, like if you want to, if you want more races like the Olympics, how about a bunch of four person teams? <laughs> then yeah. you're gonna get complete chaos, and it'll be very very exciting. Like there's a whole bunch of other things you can do. Anyway, that's enough on the race radio thing. Bit of history, you know, our our perspective on it. I just it's it's one of those stories that will continue to pop up because for whatever reason the UCI has decided that this is something that they want to bring up every five years for the rest of eternity but it really I don't think makes a whole lot of difference four person teams is something that we should uh, show for an off season episode I like the sound of that it'd be awesome Hello, women four, four is particularly mean let's, let's say five like four is just like wow come on <laughs> It is I a bit, it. it's, it's, especially when you've got a, a race that's 290 kilometers long. That is bonkers. The shorter anyway. stages is the other thing you could do that would actually translate into more exciting mm. racing. But anyway, maybe and we could maybe we could radio that into the UCI. Say we want shorter stages and smaller teams. There are no Australians on this podcast today, but uh, there are two Brits. 
but there are two Brits. Oh, Kelly, I you're know in Australia. Australia. But I'm in Australia. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'll stand in for them or something like that. Uh, I'll start saying no with an R at have, the end of it. Are you changing and, your nationality? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not yet. Not yet. Matthew Richardson. Kit, tell me about this. What's going on? Well, Matthew Richardson is arguably the second fastest man on the planet, on, a, on two wheels anyway, behind um, Harry Leverson. He has beaten him a few times, um, notably at the UCI Track Champions League in 2022, but most recently at the Olympics. Matt Richardson um, won silver in both the individual sprint events and bronze with his Australian teammates in the team sprint behind the Netherlands and GB. So on Monday morning of this week, um, GB time, I think, um, because Richardson is currently still here. Uh, Richardson announced... I don't think that, they're going to let him back. <laughs> he can't well, go Richardson back now. Richardson announced that he's, he's upping sticks and relocating for the, a, a new era of his career and life. He's moving back to England, to Manchester, where the um, high performance uh, GB sprinters and, and endurance track riders uh, base themselves um, and changing nationality. Now, the, the interesting thing with Richardson is that he was born in Maidstone, Kent, in England, to two English parents. He then moved for his father's work to Australia at age nine. And he, he, he always talks about, he has always talked about when he races in London or Manchester or, or even Scotland, it feels like a home race because so many, so much family attends. So it's not a completely ludicrous, um, it's not a completely ludicrous move. Um, in my opinion, I am British. So it is, you know, I, I do understand the You don't mind taking he, him. He's, he's, what, what's, I think what's interesting here is that it's a move from, I mean, Australia has got a long history with track sprinting, perhaps, or track cycling, perhaps less so with track sprinting. But they have been, I mean, the, the Australian cycling um, statement talks about, you know, they've really been upping their game. But in, in Britain, you've got Sir Jason Kenny and Chris Hoy, but you've got Sir Jason Kenny, who is the head coach of the sprinters. And he was the last man to beat Leverison at an Olympics. And he's sticking around. So presumably there's that in play. Yeah, Richardson's got family here. He has already got dual citizenship. So it's not a, it's not a kind of crazy change. It's not like... Australian chap, what was his name? Shane Perkins, who defected to Russia. That's probably the wrong word to use, but he, he, he switched to Russian nationality <laughs> through no, um, no family ties, but he, his friend, his Russian cyclist friend um, suggested, why don't, you, uh, why don't you try and switch after he was shut out of the Australian team in 2015? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because we've talked about changing nationalities before, for sometimes for political reasons, sometimes for family reasons, sometimes for more opportunities. Um, if you're on a nationality that's got a huge, huge background in a certain sport um, and it's very hard to get a place, then switch to a smaller team, then you might get a ride at the Olympics. And that's what we're talking about here is, is you know, Richardson's main event is the Olympics. It's not like road cycling where the Olympics is a nice bit of bling, but really the bigger events are in the road cycling calendar. But it might, well, not be, would... it might not be a sporting decision at all. It might be that his family's moving back. So it's, it, I think that we might learn more about this as time goes on. It, it may not be a sporting decision, but I mean, he could move to Britain yeah, without true. changing nationality. Yeah, yeah, so. that's true. But he, he has... Uh, what are the rules around this? Like uh, in, in, in soccer football, like once you declare, mm -hmm. you can't switch, right? You can't, you can't switch. Once you represent... Uh, yeah a country in a competitive game at Elite. senior level, then you can't switch from that point onwards. But you can, as we know all too well, represent Ireland at underage football <laughs> levels and then switch to England. I mean, this is how most of the American uh, soccer team is formed. Is with, you know, guys, guys pick the US instead of Mexico or... Well, I have, a, I, I have an old school friend who, who so I, I was educated in Cambridge. Um, at, 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 not, I wasn't at Cambridge University. I'm not going to, I haven't got lofty, I'm not going to pretend that I went to Cambridge University, but I, I was, I was educated in Cambridge and a friend of mine uh, you, you now plays do that. rugby we for check. the USA. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, both my parents were at Cambridge. I'm not going to pretend. Anyway, but yeah, no, so with, with, it, it is, it is slightly different with the Olympics and it's not, un, like I've said, it's not unheard of for um, athletes to choose the team of their grandmother, the, the nation of their grandmother in order to get a guaranteed seat on the bus. But typically, I think even with the Olympics, it's, it, it's quite, I mean, it's quite easy, um, if that's the right word, to, uh, to switch 
as, as long as there's not there's been a three year gap between elite competitions, unless there is a sort of special dispensation um, through the UCI. So it's it's the UCI that granted Richardson this shift. Apparently, he heard during the Olympics. But you know, he's he's got a British passport. His parents are British. He's got British family. So um, I, yeah, I would imagine it's a combination of the two. It's it's Jason Kenny. It's it's an elite system. Possibly easier access, less expensive access to big competitions. Maybe there's a bigger technological um, sort of innovation within the British system because it's just been around longer and been more established. I don't know. We might find out. We might not. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, with the Shane Perkins situation, it was a special executive order from Vladimir Putin. But Shane Perkins hadn't competed um, since 2015. And he then got shut out of the Rio Olympics. Um, by well, shut, shut, I mean, the wording of the article I read. Russia shut, was shut out of the Rio Olympics. No, 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 no. <laughs> he was shut out of the Australian team for the, tw- for the 2016 Olympics. So then he oh, thought, sorry. I want yes, to race Tokyo in the Olympics and... again. So he switched right. to um, Russia. But then, of course, he never competed again. Because Russia did bad things. Yeah. The other one that sticks out in my head is, uh, didn't Davide Rebelling, rest in peace, uh, represent Argentina for a while, or at least tried to, that because he was getting he was getting shot out of the Italian team for the Olympics. Mm. And I think it was post Athens 2004, he then declared or attempted to, to, to declare for Argentina. And then but switched back. He must have switched back because by Beijing, wasn't he winning medals for the Italian team? Madness. I'm pretty sure his I'm pretty sure his Beijing bronze or silver. It's he definitely was definitely friendly. Yeah, it was he was with Italy. Definitely friendly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think what makes it more odd or not or, or what makes it more curious is that he is already very successful. And typically it's it's a slightly um less a, a rider slightly earlier in their career or who's trying to find themselves opportunities. So <laughs> Nice wording <yeah>. kit. <laughs> I tried. Uh it, that and that note sort of it rings a bell for me, Kit, because it's a bit of a touchy subject here in Ireland. We get a lot of people declaring for Ireland. Um, and let's just say, uh, I was going to say a lot of writers based in Ireland, but shall we say a lot of parents of writers based in Ireland don't generally like when writers not based in Ireland are taking mm. Irish team slots. Um, my sense. opinion on it has always been that if as a nation of people who have had to emigrate for centuries, if the uh, descendants of those people who had to emigrate through no choice of their own come back and want to represent Ireland, that we should represent them with, or we should welcome them with open arms, as so long as they like are vaguely aware of where in Ireland they, their heritage comes from. Um, and it, it, could, it could be, it, it, you shouldn't be like, I, I can recall one example where I asked a writer, where's his grandparents from? And he said, somewhere beginning with E. I, th- I think you should know more than that if you want to represent a country. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps it's something along those lines that um, that we're seeing here. That he he just some feels kind of accent British. test. <laughs> yeah, uh, Richardson maybe just feels British, and you know, living in Australia it was it was just the easier the path of least resistance was not. That's maybe the wrong way to say it, but you know, being a kid growing up in Australia, it was probably made cycling easier to access by representing Australia until the point where he's moving back to Britain now. He's always felt British anyway, perhaps. And now mm-hmm. he's decided that, you know, going forward, I've done my bit. I've delivered a medal for Australian cycling. If I'm going to do all that again, I want to do it mm-hmm. in Britain because I feel British and I'm going to be living there in a way. Well, he's, he's one he's of also, our own. Yeah, he's Matthew also given Richardson. interviews. I mean, obviously he's not, he's not anticipating, well, hopefully he's not anticipating another pandemic, but he and uh, some of his teammates, Tom Cornish, for instance, he was living with Tom Cornish during the, um, during the pandemic. And he was, he spoke, about missing out on competition during because Australia was really shut down um and uh, he missed out on on competitions it's quite it's you know it's hard to get anywhere from Australia so Don't what I you're know saying, it. So what you're <laughs> what you're saying is that a global pandemic doesn't make more exciting racing not on the track <laughs> what does Matthew well, Richardson know that we don't <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> hmm. so uh if you had to switch allegiances and and compete in podcasting for a different country what country would you compete for? Good question. Podcasting? Great question, Kaylee. Well, um, I took my first steps down under, so can I claim that? Did you? I'll swap, I'll swap with Matthew. I'll swap with You're Matthew. You're going Aussie? You're going Aussie, I'll go Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would actually like to do the Irish thing because I think, I think the delight in being an English person competing for Ireland and the anger that would cause would it be does. funny. It's characteristic um, of Johnny, isn't it? And yeah, also Ir- Irish um, sports radio. I've seen, there's like a couple of clips that sometimes pop up. I can't remember from what shows, but it's pretty fun. 
You've also got the delis that you could have your lunch. The delis, yeah. Yeah, I think that should be the test if in to test if people are actually Irish to compete. They have to know like what a, a hot deli is. <laughs> and turf. I think I'd go Italian. You go Italian. I'm like half Italian. Yeah, I'm half Italian. Oh yeah, I remember this. Like rel- not relatively recent. I, I've I've a, a strong allegiance, the right word to use to to Australia. I, I've a, I've a lot of family there and been there a lot, and kept, didn't quite take my first steps there, but I was there before I could even step. Well, like, if so you take that, Australia, I'll take Norway because I've got Viking blood too. So well, I was oh. I was going to there be more there be, s- might be more spots in the Olympic team as well. <laughs> I, I was going to say uh, with you having already taken Australia, I would give myself no chance of qualifying for the, qualifying for the Olympics, and I would pick Belgium. Oh, but, good. No, good job. yeah, of course. <laughs> Landry and Ronan. Mm. All right, I think that's enough. That's enough going around. I feel like Ronan, you you make a good Aussie. Yeah, yeah. he's got the cap on backwards already. So yeah, it's twice <laughs> today I've had my backwards cap referenced. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I, uh, Ronan, did you, did you expect I, so much attention for your your headwear today? No, I mean the last time I wore the right way round. Oh yes, he was just saying national. You just look like a rally and, driver for, now. For placeholders, he puts it on backwards because he's ready to get a bit a bit crazy. <laughs> I think we need Ronan to wear the official tradie uniform of Australia at the tour next year. So we need mm. some like real short shorts, some <laughs> big old boots, <laughs> and some sort of fluorescent orange vest. Uh, I told you, I'm, I'm Belgian. I'm, I'm Belgian. What's the national outfit of Belgium? Blue. Beige. What? Beige. Oh. <laughs> hmm. T-Rex. Damp. <laughs> Find out. Oh, we, we didn't talk about T Rex. Oh, we didn't we talk really about T Rex. It's more of a visual. That's more of a visual story than a podcast story. That is very true. Yeah. I, uh, very briefly, because people keep asking me why the T Rex, which is currently adorning the front of well, it's Quickstep's bursting out of shirt. the front of the jersey. It's bursting out. It's because Sudol uh, has a sub brand yep. of I think it's an adhesive. Yep. Or something. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Called T Rex. Yes. And so they just decide they just it's one of those classic like they just took another brand within the same company and they just it's that extra that strong, isn't it? That's but, the insinuation. Yeah, but it's you know, but it's just great because it's a dinosaur. Oh, I love it on the front. and they keep going with it as well. There's a Van Seven Van Sevasaurus is on the attack, dude. Really, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so good. I think it's it's another classic example of cycling seeing two options and picking the one that's going to like they had Sudal and they had T Rex. A couple of years ago, when Sudal yeah. came on to sponsor Quickstep, and they chose Sudal, and from yeah. that, from it that moment been on, from day one, yeah. I like the idea that Lefevre was like, "Well, keep calling me the dinosaur, and we're just going to embrace mm. it." <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we're going to wrap up for today. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Placeholder Podcast from Australia. Wow. Are you about to say from Australia? I've been Kaylee Fretz. <laughs> you should. I, I, I like that. Right. This is like a late that's night what, show that's what sort of thing. Sounded like it was going to be from Australia. I've been Kaylee Fretz. Everyone else, do it from under a tree in London for hopefully the last time. I'm Johnny Long from Scotland. I'm Kit Nicholson. <laughs> Why do you say Scotland with such venom? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to think what to say from the hole in the middle of my building. There we go. From Kit from Nicholson. inside a backwards cap. I've been running my garden. Nice. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.